is alive and well. We, we did 2020 strong last year, and we're doing 21 stronger this year. In order to be stronger, we have to be stronger in the Word of God. Amen? But, you know, my title is Let Go and Let God. And, and, uh, and that is different for everybody. Let me say that again. <laughs> That's different for everybody because different people have things that need to let go of. Some people need to let go of some sin that's been entangled in their life. Some people need to let go of their past failures. Amen? Some people need to let go of their past period. But there are things that we can, all of us can say, you know, I need to let go of this so I can let God do this in our lives. And, that's a, and I, I like that phrase, let go and let God. And we hear that a lot or we've heard it a lot. It's become a familiar phrase in whatever we're dealing with. But how do we do that? How do we let go and let God? You know, through tests and trials and, and, and tribulation. And, and there's going to be some, let me just say this, not a bad confession. There's going to be more challenges in 21. There's going to be more challenges for each of us in 21. We're going to deal with certain challenges. 21 is not going to go perfect. 21 is not going to be just, you know, gold and platinum and we don't have to worry about nothing. But you really don't have to worry about anything because you, we need to cast our worries on to our Father. Amen? So 2021 20, Stronger is going to be, I'm so looking forward to it. I'm excited about Victor Life. I'm excited about what God's going to do in 21. So don't stay focused on the world issues. Don't stay focused on what the media wants you to stay focused on. Because we need to stay focused on getting stronger in the Word of God. Amen? Because when we're stronger, it, 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 our world's stronger. If Christians get stronger, our world gets stronger. Yes. Let me say that again. If, I, if Christians get stronger, the world gets stronger. Amen. Amen? So we have a duty as a Christian is to get stronger, not for ourselves, but for the lost, for the world. Yes. Amen? Amen? It's easy to stay in our little cocoon and just, you know, come to church on Monday, I mean, Sundays and Wednesdays and just get excited, but... You know, when we go out into the world, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's the challenges that we have dealing with life issues. And let me say this, I, I, you know, especially to the ones, we've lost quite a few spouses this year. And a lot of, not just this year, but in recent times, in recent months, in recent years, we've had some, you know, some spouses that go on with be with the Lord. And that alone is very challenging. That is the, probably the, the most difficult thing you face in your life here on this earth is when you lose your spouse. Because your world is surrounded by them. But I want to give you specifically a little encouragement this morning. God is still God. Like my mom was saying, Job lost his wife. He lost his family. He lost his kids. He lost everything he owned. But God blessed him, and he ended up with twice as much as he had before. So don't let the scriptures don't work for you because you're dealing with a, a, a lost loved one. I know there's going to be a grieving process. That's part of the healing process. But the word is still true, yes and amen. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen? amen. And that peace that surpasses all understanding is meant for you. I know it's difficult when you lose your, you know, you, you, the, the one that you ate dinner with, you, you, you lost your spouse, the one that you, you love her, your companion. But God is still God. He can, he can, he can void that gap. Amen. Amen? He can fill in that gap that where you need him to be, he will be there for you. You have to take on responsibility of the, the spouse. You know, if it's cutting the grass, if you're a woman, you got to do the maintenance and getting the cars fixed and looking at and, But if you're a man, you got to take on responsibility of maybe paying the bills and looking after your children more so. But God is there to help you. He can get you through this. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. I, I came across a story, and I don't know if I get through my whole message, but I, I'm, I'm planning on finishing this Wednesday night anyway. But I came across a story, and uh, this lady's name was Nicole Malakowski. Nicole Malakowski joined the Air Force, and she spent 21 years in the Air Force. She retired as a lieutenant. Um, but Nicole, Cal Nicole Malakowski uh, learned how to f be a fighter pilot. She learned how to fly airplanes. And she actually was one, the first woman to ever be uh, 
nominated or would ever be picked to be on the Air Force Thunderbirds. The Air Force Thunderbirds is kind of like the Navy Blue Angels, right? You got to be really good. You got to be great at flying an airplane. You got to be able to fly in tight formation. You also got to be able to fly in turbulence. You got you to be able to fly when, when, when the, the, the wind comes against you. You follow what I'm saying? So she was speaking at a convention. I don't know where it was at. She was speaking at a convention one time, and she was talking about her journey as a, as a uh, Thunderbird, how she became a Thunderbird, and, and, and she struggled early on. She said she struggled in tight formation when turbulence was, was there, when the wind was coming against her, when there was turbulence up in the air. And she struggled so much that she, she went to another pilot, and she asked the other pilot, say, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling staying in tight formation. My plane is going all over the place in the turbulence. And what he said changed everything. He said, well, when you go through turbulence, the natural thing to do is to grip harder, is to grip the joystick harder to think you have more control over that aircraft. But he says, what you need to do is loosen your grip. He says, what you need to do is loosen your grip. And she said, what, what do you mean loosen? He said, you need to loosen your grip. He said, you need to allow the plane to glide and to dance through the turbulence so you can stay in the, on the direction you want to go. He said, if we all were to fight the turbulence and grip harder, we would all be all over the place. So what you need to do is loosen your grip. Now, spiritually speaking, that means to let go and let God. That means to let go and let God. Now, let go and let God, you notice there's two parts to that. There's our part where we have to let go. And then there's God part. Amen? Well, he'll do his part if we do our part. So we're going to talk about that this morning. How do we let go and let God? It's easier said than done. But we have to do our part so God can do his part. And a lot of times, ah, uh, I'm meddling this morning. Is that okay? And, uh, and a lot of times, you know, we are so used to making our own decisions. We're so used to doing things our way. And a lot of people, you notice, are more controlling than other people. And I want to say to you that are more controlling, sometimes it's harder for you to let go and let God. Because letting go can feel uncomfortable to you. Letting go can feel, you can feel anxiety, you feel frustrated. Sometimes you just, you feel nervous when you surrender something over to our Heavenly Father. But as a child of God, to get to the place we need to get to, we got to let God orchestrate our life. We got to let God determine the outcome. For, because what, you know what, God already knows the outcome. Because he put the end in the beginning. That means he put your destination already in you before you was even born. Amen. Amen? So we have to learn to walk in that. We have to learn to surrender ourselves. Because when you fully trust God, when you fully let go and let God, it doesn't matter your circumstances. It doesn't matter your environment. Because God is God. Has Dan Danny, has God done anything good for you? Yes. Amen. The favor of God is on you. All right, let me get into some scripture this morning. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. My goodness, we've already had church this morning. I'm just going to add to what mom's already talked about this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Philippians 4, 6. It says, be anxious for, for what? Be anxious for nothing. But in everything in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Be anxious for nothing. That means you, you cast your cares on him. Amen? Don't be anxious. Anxious means 
You know what anxious means? Full of mental distress. Uneasiness because of fear. Danger or misfortune. Or greatly worried. You know, worrisome can, can, can keep you from experiencing the things of God. Let me say that again. Worrisome can keep you from experiencing the things of God. Because when we see the devil roams to and fro, seeking him and devour, the devil is going to come at you every day. He's not going to take a day off. He's going to come at you every day to try to get you to worry about something, try to get you stressed out about something. Because if he knows, if he can clog your mind up, if he can get you thinking about stress and worry and what's going to happen if this, what, 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 suppose this happens, what's going to happen? If he can get you entertained in your thought life, he keeps you from entertaining yourself with the Word of God. You follow me? So it's important that we recognize 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety or cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Amen? There's nowhere in the Bible that says fear will help you in your battles. There's nowhere in the Bible that says fear will help you in your battles. Nowhere. So 21, we're going to be less fearful in 2021. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, 12. We're right beside it here. It's on the same page mine is. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 14. It says, not that I have already... Now this is Paul speaking. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Paul's saying, I have not arrived yet, in other words. But I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Yes. Now let's break this down a little bit. It says, not that I have already attained. Attain means to reach. It means to achieve or it means to accomplish. Paul said, I haven't, I haven't accomplished this. I haven't accomplished. Not that I've already accomplished anything. But, I'm, but I am already, that I'm already perfected, but I press on. Amen? To reach in the course of development or growth, the study Bible in this scripture says that Paul is using the analogy of a runner to describe the Christian spiritual growth. Just like a believer has not reached his goal of Christ's likeness, but like the runner in a race, he must continue to pursue it. Paul is comparing our spiritual life to a, to a runner, to a sprint or a marathon runner. Amen? But that should be the goal in everyone's belief. We should always put that as a goal in our life is to be stronger and to be more Christ-like. So we should continue to pursue Christ. Amen? So lay hold of means this. When he says to lay hold of, that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me, it means to make one's, make one's own possession. That means we need to make God our possession. He comes and dwells on the inside of us when we become saved, but we need to own that. Yes. You need to own that. Amen? Paul is saying that he will make Christ his own possession. Paul not only chose Christ for his possession, but listen to this, Christ also chose Paul for the ultimate purpose of conforming Paul into his glorious image. So not only did, did Paul choose Christ, Christ chose Paul. So I'm here to tell you this morning, not only did you choose Christ, Christ chose you. Christ chose you. Amen? In verse 14 it says, I press towards the goal. Mom was talking about this morning. We press forward. We don't stop. We don't build a campfire and talk about our feelings and our emotions. We press forward for the prize 
of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now notice here, notice here that the goal, when it says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of Jesus. Notice here that the goal and the prize are the same. It is the same thing. What is it? It's Christ's likeness. Paul is saying, I press forward. I leave those things behind. In other words, I let go of my past. I let go of my failures. I let go of the things that the enemy has held me bound with. Come on, church. You cannot obtain the prize without pursuing the goal. You cannot achieve verse 14 without conquering verse 13. Forgetting those things which are behind and then reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You're not going to be able to grasp the things that are ahead when you're letting the past keep you bound and held up. You can't get away from that. It's like being chained to something. You can't break free and press forward the purpose and the call that God has on your life when you're allowing the past to keep you bound. Amen? Amen. This means as a child of God, you must refuse to dwell on the past sins and past failures. You refuse to dwell on it. Now, that doesn't mean that the enemy's not going to come to you and try to get you to think about your past failures. Your past failures could have been yesterday. Yesterday's in your past. But that doesn't mean the enemy won't come to you and tempt you to get you to try to focus on what you don't do or what kind of weak Christian you are. But let me tell you something. You're not a weak Christian. You're a strong Christian. That's a lie from the pits of hell. And I, let me say this, a little rabbit trail. You know, a lot of times, or maybe sometimes, or maybe just me thinking, but I'm going to just think out loud anyway. When, when, when pastor's up here preaching, he's talking about the love of God. And it's, everything's true that he talks about. And I'm going to say he lives that life of love. He don't just come up here and preach it. You know, I've all, I have to admit, I, I've often thought about, man, it'd be nice to have that love of God in my life. I, I, how many of you thought that? I mean, really, let's be honest. That kind of love and compassion. Now, I'm getting better. I'm getting a lot better. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is don't look at other Christians and you see someone and think they have arrived where to the point that you're not putting yourself in a high position. I say that to say don't put yourself down because you see that someone appears to be more spiritual or more of a stronger Christian than you. You see what I'm saying? Because we're not like, you don't have like JV Christians and then you have varsity Christians. <laughs> we're all in one accord. We're all the same in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So don't think yourself as a JV Christian. I like that. Don't think yourself as a JV Christian. You're a kingdom child of God. You were called for this. So don't let the enemy keep your past around you. Break free from your past. Let go and let God. Amen? I said let go and let God. Hallelujah. This means as a child of God, you must refuse to dwell on past sins and failures. Because be dis listen to this, be because being distracted... That's what the past does. It distracts you. Being distracted by the past will debilitate your effort in the present. That's what we talked about. It debil debilitate means disable. It means to, to cripple or even to weaken your ability in the future. Because you can't, if you're not making room for the future, that means you're, letting, you're not letting go of something. Amen? All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Hallelujah. God is good. And his mercy endures forever. I'm still, on, I'm still on fire from Mama's teaching this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Receive that word. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, it says this. Do you not know 
that those who run in a race all run? That's pretty simple, isn't it? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize, what is the prize? Christ likeness. Come on now, y'all stay with me here. What is the prize? Christ likeness. It's, listen to this, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. It's not high minded, it's not proudful, it's being humble, modest, amen? Now they do, they, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we do it to obtain an imperishable crown. A crown that's not going to perish. That means you're a born again child of God. Amen. You're in the kingdom family. Therefore, I run. Thus, not with uncertainty. I run, not with uncertainty. And thus, I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline, listen to this. I discipline my what? I discipline my body, or you can say I discipline my flesh and bring it into subjection. Or you can say I bring it into obedience. Lest when I have preached to others, this is Paul speaking now, he says unless, if I don't bring my body into subjection, when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, let me break that down a little bit. We talked about temperament. Temperament, you know, is, um, is modest, humble. You could say temperament is, means self-control. That's a good word. Self-control. But listen to this. I found out, I, I did some research. I do that when I study. <laughs> I found out that the Greeks enjoyed two great athletic events. The Olympic Games and the Ishmian Games. So because the Ishmian games were held in Corinth, which you know about Corinthians, was held in Corinth, the believers were quite familiar with the analogy of running to win. Paul was speaking in an analogy that they would understand. You follow me? Verse 26 says, Therefore I run, thus not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Notice here, now... What, what Paul's saying, he talks about the runner first. He talks about how we should run in a race to win the prize. We should press forward. But then he changes, he, he changes the metaphor here to boxing, pretty much. It says, thus I fight not as one who beats the air. What is that called when a boxer fights the air? Shadow boxing. Paul's saying, I'm not a shadow boxer. I don't fight. Notice here it says, he changed to illustrate the point that he was no shadow boxer. Paul said, I'm not a shadow boxer. I don't fight the air for no reason. Just waving my arms to no effect. When you are in a fight, shadow boxing is not going to do you any good at all. When you shadow box, when you're in a fight, you're not going to land any punches. You follow me? A word, let me say this. But then he goes on to say, let's see, what, let's see what is effective here. This is what is effective in verse 27. I, I don't shadow box, but verse 27, this is where it's effective at. I discipline my body. That's where he becomes effective. I discipline my flesh, flesh and bring it into subjection or bring it into obedience. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. A word closely identified with subjection, of course, is obedience. I bring my flesh into obedience. Some of you need to let your flesh go. You need to bring it into obedience in 21 and let go of 2020. Amen? Now, listen to this. It says, I myself should become disqualified. Disqualified is, a, is another metaphor in the athletic games. I like this. A contestant who failed to meet basic training requirements could not participate at all. They could not participate in the athletic events. That went over your head right there. Much less an opportunity to win. So we have to be not only trained in the Word of God, we have to know what we're doing in the Word of God so we can run the race that God set before us. We can press forward to the prize and the goal of being Christ's likeness. 
Because the enemy every day is going to wake up and try to get you focused on something that you should not be focused on. Now, especially women, I shouldn't say that, but women seem to have a tendency to worry more than men do. Is that fair to say, men? Come on, help me. Come on, men. Y'all got my back, don't you? Nick, you ain't saying nothing. You ain't going to say nothing. Okay. <laughs> but, but in general, moms worry about their children. Is that fair to say? They worry more about their kids than the men do. I, I can say that because I know. You, got, you follow me? You follow me, Travis? But, but worrying is not of God. You know, we've got two young boys. Proud, proud of both of them. They're on their own. They work hard. They make money. They survive. They provide for their families. They're not as spiritual as I want them to be. They're not as spiritual as I would like for them to be. I'm going to just be honest with you. They don't devote their time to come to church like they should. But I do know raising kids when they're at home is a little less stressful for the mothers than when they leave home. Because you have some type of control over when you're in your house. But when they leave home, then you've got no control basically over them a lot of times. Amen? So there's opportunities to worry about your children. Amen? I don't know where I was going with that. But anyway, <laughs> but, but we have to let go and let God. Sometimes you've got to just surrender it to God. And, that, and let me say this. Let go and let God doesn't mean that you don't do anything. Let go doesn't mean that you don't do anything. It's kind of like that, 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 that familiar phrase, stand still and see the salvation of God. You know, that was when Jehoshaphat was coming against a battle that he knew physically he wasn't able to win. But the word of the Lord came to him and says, don't worry. The battle's not yours, but the battle's mine. The battle is not yours. The battle is mine. 2021, I want you to remember that phrase. The battle's not mine, but it's God's. Surrender to him. Amen? But stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It's kind of a parallel statement with let go and let God. But there's a, that does not mean don't do anything. If you remember in that, in that story when it says stand still and see the salvation of God, immediately after that, they started praising and worshiping God. They started praising and worshiping God. They started giving God glory and honor. And actually, they, they sent the praisers to the front lines. They didn't send them. They didn't send the ones that had the AR-15s. Some of you men know what I'm talking about. They didn't send the ones that had the, 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 the semi-automatic rifles. They sent the praisers out to the front lines. Amen? And that's what we got to do when we go through tests and trials. We do, we, we, we want to let, it, it, when the battle, the devil comes against us, even if it's family issues. And a lot of times, you heard me say this before, sometimes our biggest battle is with our families. That's true. Because that's normally our circle we hang out with the most. But you got to let go and let God. Amen? Amen? Let go and let God. I was going somewhere with this story and I forgot where it was at. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You. But we, you know, it doesn't mean don't do anything. That's where it was at. It doesn't mean not fuss. Let go doesn't mean don't do anything. You still have to pray. You still have to read your Bible. You still have to prepare for battle. You do that by every day get up with a scripture in mind. Read the word. Pray and, and, and get, the, get the word in you. S set the temperature for the day. Set the temperature for the day. That means don't, let, don't be a thermostat, right? Well, do be a thermostat. Is that right? Don't be a thermometer. Be a thermostat. You should be a thermostat. You should set the temperature. You know, a thermostat, you set temperature. I'm just giving you a little basic. And I get it confused sometimes. But you set the temperature for the day. That doesn't mean the devil's not going to come at you. It doesn't mean that he's not, you're not going to have thoughts that you shouldn't have. But you can cast them thoughts down. Amen? Amen. You put your cares on him. Hallelujah. 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 Praise Father. I'm going to not get to the whole, but I just want to say, let me just, let me introduce Wednesday night. How about that? Let me introduce Wednesday night. All right, let's do this. Let's go to, uh, I'm going to finish with this. Isaiah 43, 19. 
This is what we're going to talk about Wednesday night. I might do a little bit of what I was supposed to do tonight, but hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say glory. Glory, glory, glory. glory. Hallelujah. Now let's start with verse 18. 43 and verse 18 says this. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Don't let the past, don't keep dwelling on the past. Verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Hallelujah. I will do a new thing. Now shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I even make a road in the wilderness. Wednesday night, we're going to talk about the wilderness. How God makes a path in the wilderness where there seems to be no path. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.